If you've ever heard the term executive function and felt a little confused, what does that exactly mean? How can I help support my students who are working on this skill? You are going to want to listen to this podcast episode from the beginning to the end. I had the pleasure of interviewing Sarah Ward. She is a speech language pathologist. You've probably heard her name before. She specializes in this area and man, she shared such amazing information about assessment, about intervention. And it's just information that I personally, even despite attending all the conferences and doing reading all the articles, I have learned so much new information. You have to listen to this one. Whether you're working with younger students or older students, even through adults, executive function plays such an important role in our everyday. She shares with us amazing information and information in a framework that I am excited to start implementing with all of my students. I told Sarah, I'm going to send you an email, Sarah, about how I'm implementing this with my students. I was just talking with a fellow teacher yesterday about executive function and how I was going to help support that with a student. Um, And Sarah is, you know, she has 25 years experience in the treatment of executive dysfunction. She's an internationally recognized expert on the area. She has her 360 thinking executive function program. Um, And she really has a personal story too that she shares that's very touching about how she started specializing um, in this area. So if you want to learn, if you want to dive in, if you want to be inspired on how to help your students, you got to tune in. This is such a great one. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Thanks so much for joining us on episode 45. We have a great episode today. I'm so excited. We have with us Sarah Ward. Um, Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. It's so nice to have you on. Oh, I'm so excited to be here and thank you for having me today. I'm looking forward to chatting today. Yes, definitely. And I think I first found out about you and your work because I think you were, did you do a talk for the SLP Summit a couple years ago? Have you done yes, that? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. So f- I think four years ago when I first started my business, ABA Speech, I did a talk for them, which was very exciting. I remember finding out on Zoom after I gave my talk that there were about 500 people. And when I first started my business, that really would have made me very nervous. Now, you know, I get a lot of people that attend <laughs> my webinars, but um, I was like, oh my goodness, that kickstarted my email list and just all the things. So, but I remember hearing about you and, and watching your presentation and I thought, oh, I need to have you on. I need to have you on the podcast. Um, so I'm excited that you're here. So can you tell us a little bit about you, your journey to being a speech therapist, how you kind of started specializing in executive function and all those great things? Sure. So, um, I have always been speech pathologist in the sense that that was what my degree was from school. Um, I initially started working at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, on the inpatient and outpatient traumatic brain injury unit. So certainly lots of patients who have traumatic brain injury, uh, lose their executive function skills because of injury and, uh, need rehabilitation to gain those skills back. Um, and the kind of part one and part two of that was, um, I have a daughter and a son, uh, but my daughter has really significant ADHD and dyslexia. And she was, um, what they called kind of an explosive child when she was a little kid. Um, if you're familiar with Ross Green's work and, uh, it was because she had lagging development of executive function skills. And so that certainly, took me down the path of, well, if she's not developing them, how do you actually teach them? I mean, I knew what the executive skills were, but not a lot about the development around it. Um, And uh, most people who know my story know as well that my husband was riding his bicycle and got hit by an 18-wheel Mack truck and thrown 45 feet and sustained um, a very severe traumatic brain injury and was in a coma for eight weeks. And we got out of coma and we got to rehab and we got home. And so there was uh, this situation where I had... um, Um, a husband who lost his executive skills and a daughter who wasn't developing them. And so that just sort of took me down the path of, well, how do you actually teach these skills? And um, I think that's something that is particularly motivating for me is 
it's so critical to be at the practical level. And, you know, individuals just, especially, you know, clinicians just want the tools and the strategies. How do you actually remediate it as opposed to just tell me what executive function is. So that's a really big focus of um, our practice. And my co-director, Kristen, um, she and I, Kristen Jacobson, she and I have been working together for 27 years. And we've authored our 360 thinking um, methodology for executive function. And that's the basis. It's just all about practicality. Wow. I did not know that, Sarah. Wow. That's Mm -hmm. so, I can't imagine having that in your own home, right? Where it's your daughter and your husband on both sides, but they're still needing to work on those skills. It's so fascinating that you shared that because I had Laura Smith on a previous episode and she specializes in apraxia and her daughter was diagnosed with apraxia um, and has some concerns and needs some support. And she, uh, you know, she was a general speech language pathologist. And then when her daughter got this diagnosis, she really focused on that. And now her whole private practice is based on that. So you you just kind of dug in to be able to help your loved ones. And now you're helping so many people. I love that. I, I didn't know that. So excited to dive in today because I know, you know, as a treating clinician, I work three days a week as a school-based therapist. And so I work in a middle school and high school. And I was actually just talking yesterday oh, yeah. with a teacher um, about a student who, uh, you know, has within average, uh, you know, core language skills as evidenced on a serenized test, um, but is still struggling with executive function. And I was like, oh my oh, goodness, absolutely. you know, this is how I want to support this student. This is what the student really needs support with. Um, And we were talking about that. And I was, I was excited to have you on the podcast because I can take that into my IP meeting next week. But um, so can you tell us if, if there are parents that are listening, we have a a mix of parents and and therapists that listen. Um, When we say executive function and executive function skills, what kind of encompasses that as just a starting point so we can dialogue about it more in depth? So um, I think that it's important to distinguish something, which is that typically when you talk about executive function, a lot of people talk about, oh, it's that, you know, manager in your brain that helps you to organize your materials and record your homework and turn in your homework and clean your bedroom and all of those things. And while, you know, organization of materials and planning your time and all those, there are executive skills. It's actually really the product of the executive system, not the executive skills themselves. So I think a more helpful understanding and definition is, is that executive function is that skill that allows you to have forethought and to visualize what lies ahead in time and then plan backwards from that, how you're going to accomplish the tasks and the things that you need to do um, over the course of time to be able to complete that. So for example, even though you're sitting here listening to me and we're chatting, I guarantee you have a movie going through your head that says, okay, soon as I hang up with Sarah, I've got to quickly run into, I love the example of like the laundry room, throw the wash into the dryer. I've got to lay the lunches out on the thing. I've got to make sure my kindergartner's up and has her backpack on and we need to be out the door. And that's important because the minute you hang up with me, you're headed into the laundry room. And the second you leave the laundry room, you already know you're going to the kitchen and what you're going to do. Now, that ability to mentally visualize what you're going to look like in a future time, uh, we have a favorite phrase, which is that 90% of the time, task planning happens in a different space from where you execute the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's very important because oftentimes kids who are struggling with this skill, they may not visualize the future. They may not visualize themselves in time. They may not visualize themselves in a future space. So for example, you might say to your fifth grader while you're eating breakfast, okay, we need to go upstairs. You need to make sure you get your shin guards and your soccer uniform, and we're going to leave the house in 10 minutes. Well, what you're doing as the parent, you're picturing the child finishing their lunch, whatever it is, or breakfast, whatever it is, putting it in the sink, then walking upstairs, going to the dresser, to the third drawer down where the uniform is, then walking to the closet where the shin guards are and coming back downstairs. But if a child's not developing that visualization of the future, you say, go upstairs, go upstairs. The child goes upstairs, they walk in their room, see Legos and sit down and start playing Legos. Right, <laughs> and you think, right. oh my gosh, why are you playing Legos? Like, this is not the time for Legos. Like we're out the door. 
And they need, they're typically highly prompt dependent. So they need a lot of support in saying, okay, go upstairs, go upstairs, get your shin guards, get your shin guards, get your uniform, get your uniform, go back downstairs. No, 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 grab a water bottle. And the problem is we end up doing all that sort of visualization and planning for the student. And so the critical concept around executive function is more heavily rooted in forethought. What lies ahead in time? What are we going to look like? And how do I plan backwards from that? And in young children, that very typically just presents oftentimes as sequencing. You know, how do I sequence Mm -hmm. the steps of a task to achieve that goal? But holy moly, by the time you hit middle and high school, now you are planning over time, except that that time window gets longer and longer and longer. So it's no longer just pick up your sneakers off the floor. It's remembering to put your sneakers in your backpack, put your backpack by the door because you need your sneakers tomorrow. And in high school, it's okay. I've got to put my cleats in my baseball bag because I have baseball next Friday and we have a practice on Thursday. So I'm going to need my turf shoes for that. I better put that in. You're you're planning over greater, greater distances of space and time. And that's why uh, you talked about in IEP meeting, Typically, kids are going to present with really solidly average, if not significantly above average scores on standardized testing. Mm -hmm. And those executive skills aren't going to get picked up because your standardized tests can't really access how you're planning over time. And and they're not going to look at your ability to remember something over a 24, 48, 72-hour week-long period. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. Oh my goodness. Yeah. There's so many steps involved. I always say that Mm -hmm. too, if I'm working on social skills or anything, you know, with students, which is really individualized and nuanced, but I always say, boy, these things get so sophisticated guys as we're in middle school and high school. I said, man, I'm 42 and I'm telling you what social skills are still like, (laughs) there's always a dynamic, right? There's always things that get more nuanced, more sophisticated. And yeah, listening to that is really, yeah, that's a lot. You know what I mean? And talking about prompt dependent, I'm just thinking of like, and I know we'll get into it, but you know, once you're in a, especially a public school setting per se, and if maybe you have a student who has a paraprofessional um, with them, maybe to guide them in in a class, like Mm -hmm. I could see where it's really hard to kind of facilitate this because what I'm imagining is that we would eventually teach these skills, like the whole sequence or strategies. And I know you'll talk about that, but I know eventually we would fade any type of adult support. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes for adults, especially in a school setting, it's hard for them to fade that support. Sometimes they over prompt, which sounds like it could be really problematic with a student who has these problems. Absolutely. I think, I think it's very easy for paraprofessionals, teachers, parents, to be a child's prosthetic frontal lobe, as we say, Um, because, you know, as an adult, you're feeling the passage of time. So you're feeling, oh my gosh, this transition is only three minutes and we need to get your writer's notebook and your pencil and you need to get over to that group table over there. And we're visualizing the student at the table with their workbook, with their pencil and moving through space to achieve that goal. But if you have a student who's not doing that skill, then they're like in the classroom going, ooh, shiny object. And off they (laughs) go and they're seeing something and you have to say, okay, go get your pencil. And they get the pencil and then it's okay, now you need your writing book. And we often describe these kids as being kind of zigzaggers. Sometimes they're inefficiently navigating the space as opposed to saying, all right, let me picture myself over there I'm at that table, I'm in reading group, and what does that actually look like? I have my book, I have my pencil, and then how do I match that picture? Well, I've got to go to the material zone and grab my materials, and then I've got to navigate that way. And so um, an interesting component of that, and I know this is more an audio than a visual podcast, but um, a a huge component of our kind of uh, remedial program, if you will, we're huge fans of the work of Dr. Russell Barkley. And, and Dr. Barkley, of course, was kind of one of the founding fathers, if you will, of executive function intervention. And he really says, look, if we're not going to compensate for kids' executive skills, prompt them, cue them, check off their homework as being complete, 
and we're really going to neurologically bring change, the only way we do that is if we get kids to stop, see the future, feel the future, say the future, play with the future, and go towards the future. And there are two important parts of that. One of those is to feel the future. Now, typically we think of feel the future as being, oh, emotionally feeling, am I going to be rushing? Am I going to be uh, relaxed? Am I going to be stressed? Um, and that's one part of it. But a more valuable way of thinking about feeling the future is how would you actually touch and feel the future? And we know the way that humans do that is through something called co-thought gesture. So we oftentimes, when we're talking about our plans, we gesture. So I might say, oh, I need to leave here. I need to pick up my son. I need to bring him home. I'm going to get dinner on the table. And then I need to do the laundry. And we gesture. Now, I might put my hands in a small arc and say laundry, or I might put them out wide and say laundry, which means I'm visualizing I have a little or I have a lot of laundry I have to do. And so having kids literally gesture their plans and movements is a way we help kids to feel the future. So if your child was downstairs eating lunch and it was time for soccer, we don't have them repeat the direction. We actually have them gesture how they're going to carry out that plan. Well, I need to go upstairs. I need to go into my bedroom. I need to get my uniform out of my dresser, my shin guards in the closet, and then I need to go to the bathroom and come back downstairs. And when we find that they gesture and feel the future, it enables them to create that visualization and move more effectively through time and space. Wow. I've never heard of that. That is so very interesting. And it makes so much sense. I think there's so much tied to, you know, using our bodies in that way. It, it just it really random, but there's this TEDx talk. Maybe you've heard it by, I think, Amy Cuddy. She talks about power poses. She has this amazing TED talk. But anyway, she says to feel more confident and things like that, that she would do. And she had something happen to her that was like, she was like maybe in Ivy League college. I might be botching this, but, and then she had like a traumatic accident, but she was able to regain everything. But she talked about feeling confident in situations and she talked about doing these power poses that she would do. It's a very, very popular TED Talk. And I don't even know how I watched it a long time ago, but it made a lot of sense. Kind of this idea of getting our body involved to make our right. mind kind of correlate with that. I've never heard that before. I think that's so very fascinating. I'm excited to implement some of these things. It makes a lot of sense because you're saying like that would help them visualize into the future. Cause I was wondering too, that seems so abstract for some students to be able to mm -hmm. see into the future because, you know, sometimes moms will joke and I'll see so that things online where, you know, a mom has this running log of, okay, this is the grocery list, but their running log is like in the pantry. Well, I used the chicken broth last week. I did this. And we have all these things running in our brain because we can Absolutely. see that that is going to be a problem, but sometimes that might not just be inherent for everybody. So this is a way to kind of bring no. the future and visualize it and to make it more concrete almost, right? Yep, absolutely. And the, you know, the thing about it is there's a whole, uh, I guess I might use the word movement, although I use that word yeah. loosely, of um, this theory called embodied cognition, which is both that the physical movement of your body triggers your cognition as well as your cognition can trigger your movement. And so, uh, that is also a second sort of very important part. And here's the reason why in terms of remediation a little bit. One thing that we find, um, and Chris and I have an article coming out on this in I think one of the December ASHA journals, but um, one of the things that's very fascinating is that when you listen to kids uh, describe how they're going to accomplish a task and do something, uh, many of the students with uh, poor executive skills use very vague verbs. So you say, um, how are you going to get your lab report done? I'm just going to write it. Okay, well, what do you need to do? Well, just write it. All right, well, what do you need? Just the lab. You know, there's not this sense of strong verbs of, well, I need to write out the hypothesis. I need to list out the materials. Then I need to draft a table that incorporates the methodologies. I need to evaluate the methods and determine the uh, conclusion. You know, there's, it's missing right. those verbs. Uh, in younger children, for example, if you're doing an art or a craft with them and you say, all right, well, 
gosh, you know, uh, how are you going to make that? They're like, well, I'm just going to make it. Yeah. Whereas kids with stronger executive function ki- will use very specific verbs and they will say, well, I'm first going to lay out the pictures. Then I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to spread the glue on the back. And you hear these very strong verbs. What's fascinating is when you have kids who have vague verbs and their executive planning is poor, One of the things that we find is if I say to a student, show me with your hands what you're going to do. And they'll say, well, I'm going to like, you know, cut out the picture. As soon as they show me with their hands, Mm. they begin to get the specific verb. So then they'll say, well, I'm going to put glue on the back. Now, if a kid just goes, I'm going to put glue on the back. And I say, you mean you're going to take glue and just go like this? And, you know, they'll kind of like throw their hand out there and they'll say, well, no, I'll say, okay, show me with your hands, how you're going to put the glue on. And they'll say, well, like, I'm going to go from this corner to that corner, to that corner, to that corner. And as soon as they show me with their hands and can get specific, then they'll attach the verb. So I'm going to put the glue corner to corner to corner. So it will adhere and they'll be much more specific. So it is, um, language wise as speech and language Mm -hmm. pathologists, um, I'll just make the quick sidebar that I think, unfortunately, especially in the public schools, when you do enter a team meeting and they've identified the child as having executive challenges, typically they don't get on the speech pathologist caseload because there's not a communication impairment. So Mm -hmm. it usually falls under the um, uh, treatment of say the special educator or a Mm -hmm. guidance counselor. I really argue differently that the speech and language pathologist, we are absolutely bound to be working with these kids because we work on both the visual language as well as that physical language and the verbs. And so we're really working on their ability to generate sequences and the language associated with task execution. Uh, And we need to teach that. Yeah, I love that. And this particular student, we are, I am going to keep him on services, but I'm like, oh, I really want to target this. But I I just don't think speech therapists, like a lot of this information that you're sharing, and I feel like I go to a lot of conferences and I'm really gung-ho on professional development, but you know, I really haven't learned all these things you're talking about. I think that it makes so much sense that, I mean, when you were talking about, you know, having them gesture and then they start using more, you know, robust verbs that to me, that was like, oh, wow, that's like more robust language. That's a more specific way to communicate. Um, Yeah, I think that this is just really specific training. I think it's so cool that you're sharing it. Um, But that was, you know, why is this? Well, that was going to be one of my questions is, you know, why is this an important area for speech therapists to think about during our work with students? But it makes like so much sense that it's going to carry over to so many other parts of the student's life. Like I always say as a middle school and high school therapist, you know, for me, like the real magic happens happens, seldom do I see students like really in my therapy room, unless it's a student who has, is stuttering or selective mutism or something like that. But, you know, it sounds like these are just things that really, I love the idea of visualizing the future because these are things that the student could, you know, well, how are you going to do that book report? How are you going to do your, you know, vocab lesson, like having them really recap it? Because I'm thinking of many students in my head who have some language type goals who I know would use vague verbs. And I know would be saying the things that you're saying. Um, so it makes so much sense because it just, it has a more, more of a dialogue for them to be able to help plan it and to really visualize it. I like that idea of talking about visualizing the future, like planning in the future. I guess I'm so type A and maybe I do have good executive function skills that in my brain, it's, you know, not that I can't shut it off because I can't, but you know, it's always running. I always have a running log. You're right. I do have laundry right now that's going, you know, like I have all these things. Um, but it's great to point that out that not everybody's brain is working like that, but these steps can help make that visualizing the future more concrete, um, for students that are struggling with these things. So my question is, so what's interesting to me is so, you know, with your private clinic, so you guys specialize obviously in this area. Um, Mm -hmm. What, so if speech therapists, you know, see students who are kind of struggling like this, what, what types of assessments are there that would really capture this? I mean, like I believe in, and I just, in my new toddler course, you know, talked about, you know, an observation is obviously part of a 
you know, the gold standard for assessment. Like I always include, and I, I worked clinically before in non-public programs, you know, with my applied behavior analysis, I have my BCBA too. So, you know, I would do tons of observations and, you know, 20 page evaluation reports. And so that kind of part of me is still there. Um, and I oh, take yeah. that into the public school, but I always include observations because a lot of the students that I serve on my caseload are going to do fine on a standardized test. It's always like, I always say it's the application that the student would benefit benefit from feedback, coaching, guidance, you know, on these skills. Um, But, you know, what assessments are out there that would help us kind of get more of a a better picture of how the student has with their executive function skills? So it's a little bit of a dicey question. And the reason why it's a little bit dicey is because typically the um, assessments that really look at the true executive skills um, can only be administered by a licensed neuropsychologist or um, someone who does psychoeducational evaluations. So Mm -hmm. for example, we definitely would look at um, parameters of the WISC to know, like the Wexler Intelligence Scale, to know, you know, how, what are the student's cognitive skills levels and how that impacts executive function. There is an assessment called the Dallas Kaplan executive function assessment, which is excellent. But again, we are not licensed to administer it. And um, I find regionally it's not used everywhere. I mean, I work all across the U.S. and I find some areas use it heavily, other areas they've never even heard of it and they don't use it. Um, So... That being said, that's kind of like part one. You have to be really skilled at knowing what you're looking at when you're reading Mm -hmm. a neuropsych report, and that's going to be informative. The second thing is, is that most of the time, um, evaluators really try to tap into the executive function skills, both through observation, but heavily through rating scales. Mm -hmm. And I have sort of some pro and con opinions about rating scales. Uh, Probably the one that is the used most widely is the brief, but again, it is a rating scale. Now that is something that we can administer to teachers and parents and even to students themselves. And that evaluates and does a good job identifying the role of true sort of organization time management versus emotional regulation and how emotional regulation is impacting. So for that reason, I like the brief. However, there's another one, there are a couple others that I think are lesser known that I really like. Um, So Dr. Barkley has the Barkley Attention Deficit Executive Function Scale. And I really like that one for this specific reason. If you have attention deficit disorder, you absolutely have executive function impairments. But it is possible to have an executive function impairment without attention deficit disorder. Mm. And I like that that particular rating scale does a good job of teasing out to what extent is attention playing a role versus to what extent is it truly executive function based and therefore attention is you know falling behind. Um, so that's a very good one. The other ones that are lesser known, but I think they're also fantastic, um, there is an online tool called the CEFI, C-E-F-I. It's the Clinical Executive Function Inventory. Now, I really like that one because A, it's online and I find you get a mm-hmm. better response. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel that it more accurately characterizes um, kids' behaviors executive function wise, I think it's excellent. And there's another one that's brand new on the market, which has some pros and cons as well. It's George McCloskey's executive function inventory. Now, George McCloskey wrote a book, excellent on executive function. And he identifies, I believe it is 23 strands of executive function impairments. My negative is, is that that's a that's a little too much for most clinicians to sort of wrap their heads around and and to kind of address. But the one positive about his scale is that it will um, basically describe the skills on a on a range as being absent, emerging, developing, progressing, mm-hmm. you know, secure, yeah. if you will. I'm not sure that's the exact phrasing of it. But I find that's really helpful because you can really see a very nice display of where students are really lagging in specific areas. 
and provide intervention, repeat that and see that you're making progress and moving the needle towards the skill being more secure. So for that reason, I think that's a a bit of a positive uh, reading scale. Um, So, you know, coming back big picture to answer your question, the first part A is unfortunately the best assessments we're not licensed to give, but you need to get good at reading a neuropsych. Uh, Part B is, I do think that some of the rating scales are very good and I encourage clinicians to check those out. Um, If a speech pathologist is working with students who have brain injury and or even not, there is a series of tests. um, (laughs) Of course, I pronounce it like the football player, uh, Brett Favre, but it's it's the F-A-V-R-E, Favre, Favre, I don't know. Yeah. And it's the Functional Assessment of Visual Reasoning and Executive Skills. And they have an adult and a student version. And I think it is excellent. It's very, very good. It really is quite dynamic and does a good job of looking at executive function. Um, but again, it's not very widely used, um, mm-hmm. but I think that's unfortunate. I like that one. Well, that's great. So I guess my final piece, and I'm being a little verbose, but um, <laughs> the the if we just look at pure speech and language tests, yeah. I think that there are a lot of really good speech and language assessments that we give that we tend to interpret through a language lens. Mm-hmm. I think we can look at it through an executive function lens and get different and unique information. So we definitely need to be evaluating the extent to which students create mental visual imagery. When they read text, do they create mental imagery? Do they envision themselves? Do they have the ability to envision something that is not right there in front of them? In other words, can they picture what someone's doing in another room that they're not in? Can they imagine what's happening on the outside of a a room? Um, Those are important skills to evaluate. And then we just want to know broadly, how effectively does this student organize information? And for example, speech pathologists, most of us are pretty familiar with the SELF, the Clinical Evaluational Language Fundamentals. Uh, There are a couple of really great tests in there to look through an executive function lens. So to give you a really good example, the word fluency task, I think we typically look at, um, you know, name as many animals as you can in 60 seconds, name as many occupations, foods, et cetera. I think a lot of times we look at that in terms of word retrieval, but my experience is that kids with um, poor executive function, you say, name for me as many animals as you can in 60 seconds, and they'll say, uh, dog, uh, hummingbird, alligator, mosquito, uh, chicken. Whereas kids with really good executive skills tend to say, Dog, cat, hamster, gerbil, guinea pig, shark, hammerhead shark, right. blue shark, nurse shark, white shark, great white shark, whale, orca yeah. whale, blue whale. You can tell that they pull a category mm-hmm. and they're using that category to aid retrieval. Um, and that's a really good indicator of how effectively they can take in and kind of organize information. Similarly, there's a negative about the self five. Yeah. as opposed to the self four. So the self four had the, um, uh, the, oh, uh, word classification test and the word mm-hmm. classification test, we scored students on both their ability to identify how words were related. And then we also gave them a score for their ability to explain why they related those two words. So for right. example, I don't remember the exact one, but if you gave them something like, um, truck, floor, sky, broom, you would want them to say, all right, well, floor and broom go together. And then they had to give a reason for exclusion. And now when they move to the self five, you are no longer scoring the student on the reason for exclusion. And I think that's, um, I think that's a downside. And I really encourage clinicians to very carefully ask why students related words and to record their answer verbatim. Because there are a lot of students who, for example, if you said something like um, chair, ocean, monitor, and lake, 
they might say, well, an ocean and a lake go together. And you might say, why? And typically a student has strong executive skills will say, well, they're both bodies of water, but one is salt and one is fresh. Whereas I find oftentimes kids with weaker executive skills will say ocean and lake and you go great and you give them credit. And then you say, why? And they'll say, well, the mineral content of the chloride, blah, 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 in the ocean is a ratio percentage related to something of the lake. I don't know. I mean, you're making this yeah. up and you go, okay. I mean, it might be right, but it's not right. the most salient answer. Right. Uh, and so what we really find is, is how are they really making relationships and connections and organizing themselves within their environment? And language is a good indicator of that. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love that because it's really going deep on on some of these thoughts. I think the thing that's so hard operating as a public school therapist is that sometimes in middle school and high school, I mean, the district I work in is very academically demanding. You know, so yesterday well, I was yesterday I was doing vocabulary.com. I was trying to help somebody and they came up with a word. The word was profile. So they needed to read through four different um kind of one sentence definitions of what profile was. So I was segueing it to something that was real for the student. And I said, well, you know, are you, I talk about, I do a lot of social media. So I said, are you on social media? Well, yeah, I'm on Instagram. Okay. I said, so on Instagram, you have your profile. What goes in your profile? Well, your name, maybe your sign, you know, it was like a very cute sixth grade answer. So the answer that was correct for profile was something about a biography. Well, my student doesn't understand what the word biography means. So it's almost like this iceberg of, you know, there's just so many right. things. I think that's what gets so hard to try to help in a public school setting is that the curriculum becomes so demanding. And I love the idea of, of really analyzing this and how can I help the student the best way? But when you start to work with students, and this is more of a language you know, issue, but I can imagine this would be a student who also would have very vague answers. This would be a student who might be able to get that correct, but they would not probably be able to tell me a, a, an idea of why those two are related. So it's just, there's so many things to address, you know, is what I'm saying, that it kind of gets hard so to tease nice. out. Yeah, so... I love that minutia though of kind of, of, of analyzing the test in that way, because that is definitely a test that a lot of speech therapists have access to. So if you had any guidance on, you know, how could speech therapists, you know, in, in general, um, you know, I like this idea of visualizing the future and things like that. But if you had some advice for therapists who wanted to start helping their students and supporting them kind of in a general way um, with executive function skills, what would you, what do you think would be our best course of action for that, Sarah? Yeah, so I definitely think that that concept of visualization and planning backwards from that is so critical. Um, and so when we present on executive function skills and recommend strategies, uh, and this is, I think, such an important thing for speech therapists, we really talk about the fact that um, forethought is heavily rooted in episodic um, future memory And that's important and for this reason. So when we think of episodic past memory, it's that movie you play in your head of a past experience, right? So if you went to the beach, you're like, oh my gosh, I see myself there. I can feel the sand. I can hear the waves. It was an amazing vacation. I mean, you really picture yourself. Similarly, when you're envisioning the future, it is like a mental movie in your head starring you, the actor or actress. You have to see yourself. And so we really visualize and the importance is is photographs. So for example, if I need a student to really work on core organization skills and I want them to be able to plan a morning routine to get out the door, I want them to be able to pack a backpack, I want them to be to clean a desk. Uh, They need to perform a chore. It is imperative that, you know, clinicians partner with parents and teachers to provide a photograph of what that completed image looks like in that future. So if you're all dressed for school, what does dress for school look like? You need to see yourself fully dressed, hair brushed, backpack on, coat over your shoulder, whatever it is. If your desk is clean, you need a photograph of your desk. What does a clean desk look like? If you're going to uh, do a chore and you need to set the table, what does a set table actually look like? Unfortunately, I think a lot of times speech therapists love picture icons and clip art. 
<laughs> and we do not recommend Clipart. Oh yeah. Oh, good. I knew I liked you. We were fast friends. Yeah. I don't either. I'm like all real life pictures. I have two products that we sell action builder cards and double up and it's all real life pictures because that's where it's at, right? For our kids. Yep. That's okay. where it's at because the, the problem is, is that it, when you have clip art, it doesn't generalize and the student doesn't have the ability to see themselves moving through space and time to actually achieve that goal. And so when you have that image of dress or that image of a desk, having kids show you with their hands how they're going to handle that task, how they're going to sequence the steps to that. Oh, I need to clean my desk. Well, I'm going to take out all the pencils and put them on the top shelf. I'm going to pull out the loose papers and arrange them on the top of my desk and organize them. Um, if you see yourself fully dressed in a photograph, well, I need to go upstairs and brush my hair and then gesturing, I need to go into my bedroom and I need to get that sweatshirt and then gesturing, I need to come back downstairs and get my lunchbox off of the kitchen counter. So those are some of the very easiest ways in developing some of those habits and routines and organization. When it comes to more complex homework and, and those types of things, Again, we're still really starting with that visualization of what done looks like. If you've worked for a half hour and you're done and you've managed your half hour, what does that actually look like? Is it a completed worksheet? Is it that you've done six of the problems? And what do you need to do to do that? And what materials will you need to get ready? And so um, Kristen and I have a program called the Get Ready, Do Done Method, which I think it's really important to understand is the fidelity of using the program is that you always start with the done. Even though we say get ready, do done, we never ever start with get ready. And that we always sort of planning um, from the idea of the done being to the right of the student, the do being in front of them and the get ready being to the left of them. Because we're planning along that spatial temporal window where, okay, what will it look like when I'm done? I need to visualize that to the right of me because that's where we tend to think of the future being as ahead of us and to the right. And then picturing what am I going to do? And then to get ready, what materials and tools do I have? And so we're constantly helping kids um, sequence and plan backwards from a future goal. So if a student has, for example, those vocabulary words that you're working on, um, most kids will be like, well, I'm just going to do my vocabulary. You know, they, they, I'm just going to get it done. They don't really right. have a sense of it and nor do they have a sense of the time. So it's more effective to say, all right, well, if you have 45 minutes and helping them to see that. So we use analog clocks and we shade right on top of an analog clock. So we shade, you know, if I'm doing homework from three to 345, we literally shade on the face of the clock three to 345 so that they can take the invisibility of time and make it visible. And then we're planning that time where if I'm doing this vocabulary worksheet, in these 45 minutes, and there are, for example, 10 vocabulary words. Well, at my 20 minute midpoint mark, what's my midpoint goal on my, on my worksheet? Well, I want to have between four and six of the vocabulary words complete so that you're constantly evaluating where you are in space and time. So it's not just your physical body, but it's the material. So if I'm going to mm -hmm. read for a half hour, my chapter, where am I going to be in space and time? Well, I want to be five pages in at that midpoint check-in. So we're always getting kids to see the time and plan the time and make sure that they're comparing those marks in time to the physical space or the space on the materials of where they're going to be um, so that they're moving through time. Because we know that that's that definition of executive function. It's planning of moving through time. 
Yeah. Oh man. I love that. There's so many things. I know you can't, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this, but I took a lot of notes because as it's nice about having a podcast, I'm like, okay, what do I want to learn today? Um, but this was amazing. Oh my God, such good information. And I, I just can't wait to start implementing it. I love it because it's a framework, like that general framework of visualizing in the future and helping people do that using the real life pictures. And that really goes with my brain about how we can lay it out and teach it antecedently. And then over time, we would fade that, right? So that the student is doing those things on their own. And honestly, this information is just great information for, I think, a lot of kids in general. I have a fifth grader who is such a procrastinator who I feel like I am the person that's like, okay, 10 minutes, get your soccer stuff. We're leaving. I'm leaving now. We're leaving. You know what I mean? So I like this idea of just them independently doing their things. And it's just great information, Sarah. This was awesome. Where can people people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, so uh, definitely check out our website, which is efpractice.com. So that makes it pretty easy, executive function practice, but EF practice. Um, and there, there are tons of resources. There's a lot of articles that we've written about executive function. Um, there's a list of all of our upcoming lectures and trainings and those things. So that's a really terrific resource. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. And if you haven't done so, it's been fun. Yeah, this has been so fun to connect. Um, Make sure if you haven't done so already that you subscribe to the podcast, you write a review. I always love hearing from you. Um, I have some new free live webinars all about working with students with autism on the website, abaspeech.org. So make sure that you visit. And thanks so much, Sarah. It was great to connect. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.